was asked briefly to talk about the PROVE Act, which is the bill that we introduced to allow 16 to 17 year olds to pre-register to vote. Um, you know, there's a lot of, not much research on what actually happens when people pre-register, um, but the idea is that uh, when years ago when I was Lieutenant Governor, I was leading a fight in Virginia for motor voter registration. That when you showed up to get your license or to get new license plates, you could register to vote then and there. Um, the governor at the time was Republican Governor George Allen, who fought it the whole time until the courts overruled it. So, so we won, which was great. But it only really makes sense that now for somebody 18 and older. And yet most of us get our driver's license at 15 and a half, at 16, a learner's and then the thing. So the idea was, let's make it when you apply for your license at 16, when you turn 18, you actually are registered to vote already. Um, it's a good idea. I, I didn't, wasn't even really aware of it until I saw a Center for American Progress report titled The Health of State Democracies that ranked all the states in terms of how good their voter registration is. And uh, good old Virginia was 50th out of 51st. I'm watching DC's in that mix. We were ahead of Alabama and behind Tennessee. So that was a little upsetting, and when you look deeper into it, the reason was because we were not one of the states that allowed pre-registration. So we looked, and I'm not in the Virginia Assembly, so we looked at the other places. You have California, Massachusetts, Hawaii, the District of Columbia, allow 16 and 17 year olds to pre-register. Uh, up to 20 allow 17 year olds to pre-register. And there's also very little effort nationally in trying to do civic education around voter registration. In fact, one of the things we see in the wake of the Great Recession is the first thing gets eliminated from curricula in high schools are the arts. And the next thing are civics. So you have less and less civics going on. So we've tried to get as many co-sponsors for this bill as possible. We have a couple of dozen Republican Democrats. We've invited every single Republican. So far, nobody's on board. Uh, and that's unfortunate because voting is good for everyone. The dilemma with the Republicans is they often fear that it will be a disadvantage for them to have young people vote. I don't necessarily think that's true. Um, the young people are pretty independent thinking, but so far it's um, no good. Uh, frequently asked questions, the Approve Act costs nothing. It doesn't cost any more to register people at 16 than it does at 18. We do put $25 million in through the Election Assistance Commission, a federal thing, to do grants to states to actually do civics to teach young people about why it's important. Um, it doesn't affect the legal voting age. This is the 26th Amendment, it's still 18. Um, it doesn't, does it have any long-term benefits? Probably the best one is that people that are used to voting vote, people that haven't voted don't vote. Um, so voting is very habit forming. I mean, some of you I know have probably knocked on doors and have street sheets. Uh, I've been dealing with street sheets for a long time. And the coolest part of looking at a street sheet is you see a guy named Mike Lusher and you look at his voting history. You know, the, there's some that vote every four years. There's some that vote every two years. There's some that vote in every single primary, every single general election. Um, I'm still feeling bad that I missed a Vienna town council election in May of 1991. I'm still consumed <laughs> with guilt about it. And I'm mad because nobody put any literature on my doorstep or knocked on my door. Uh, and if I look at my children now, who are you know, 41, 36, 24, 21, you look at their records as every primary and every general. Um, mostly because, you know, I got the whip out. But, um, <laughs> but I also want it to be a, a deep habit. You know, the old that habit leads to character and character is destiny. Um, so let me shift and say, well, why does this matter? Well, three big things. Number one, there are a lot of close elections in the world. If you go to Wikipedia right now, you can see many, many, most of them seem to be in Canada, but whatever. Um, I just think of my own experience, Lyndon Johnson, not quite my experience, 1948, he was elected to the U.S. Senate by 87 votes in Texas. He went on to become Majority Leader, Vice President, President of the United States. Uh, Mark Herring, Virginia's current Attorney General, um, was losing after the opening thing. They did the recount, he won by 323 votes. Well, he has been the most dynamic Attorney General in Virginia history. Came out right away for marriage equality and refused to defend the, the folks that were suing on it, we ended up overturning the law, giving marriage equality in Virginia. He's the one that stood up for the dreamers, that they should get state tuitions in Virginia, at UVA, and Tech, and James Madison places. He has just been a really powerful, symbolic, and functional lieutenant or attorney general, all by 323 votes out of 2 million. 
Uh, George Allen, I mentioned George with whom I served, a Republican governor. Um, we're, we're good friends, although we agreed on very little. He won by five votes when he was elected to the Virginia General Assembly. Dale remembers from Charlottesville. Um, for, for, for lack of five people, we could have had a completely different Virginia history. Probably my best example is of my, my good friend, Lindsey West, who was chairman of the Montgomery County Board of Supervisors in Virginia, which is where Virginia Tech is, Christiansburg and Blacksburg. So she's the incumbent super chairman of the Board of Supervisors. It was a close election, they did a recount, and it was a tie. And the Virginia Constitution said you flip a coin, and she lost the coin toss, um, and, and was then out of office. You guys are probably familiar with the, the so-called Muhlenberg legend, which says that for lack of one vote, German would have been the official language of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. um, this, now, it's actually a legend, because that's not actually what happened. Because um, there is no official language in the United States even now. But in 1794, the Speaker of the House, the U.S. House, was a guy named Muhlenberg, of German ancestry. And there was a petition to have all of the bills on the House floor translated into English and into German. And the petition failed. It was 41-41, and the German-speaking speaker voted no. Um, so by one vote, we don't translate the laws in. So heute sprechen wir Deutsch zusammen. No, no, we don't. Um, but uh, only because we're lucky that one vote. Number two, the things that you care about, at least that I guess you care about. Um, I asked my kids, will Social Security be there for them? And they think, no, I think it's sort of, you know, accepted wisdom that millennials don't believe they'll have Social Security. College debt. $17,000 average for undergraduates that have college debt. Um, job prospects. Um, you know, the, the most popular part of the Obamacare is that you can stay on your parents' insurance till 26. Because uh, the end, when I was running for Congress two years ago, the best line was I promised to get your kid out of your basement. Um, <laughs> the, the, all the tech things that you guys care about, net neutrality, et cetera. And then just money and politics. I'm so pleased that Common Cause is sponsoring this. But money in politics is an enormous effort. When I was overseas, we would talk about corruption in Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union. And they'd say, yeah, what about Citizens United? You know, what about the Koch brothers? Um, they'd throw it right back on our face. These are all things I believe millennials care deeply about. But if you don't vote, you don't count. You just, you're irrelevant. And so anything you can do to get young people to vote. And then the last thing, Robert Sanderson for the Washington Post has written about this very well again and again, is that our overall political structure heavily tilts towards taking care of old people. Um, you know, we don't do entitlement reform in the Congress, Democrats or Republicans, because we're afraid people over 65 aren't going to vote for us, maybe even people over 55. We, so we spend a lot more time worrying about preserving retirement ages and preserving Medicare benefits than we do about college debt, than we do about job prospects, than we do about how you can be entrepreneurs. Um, 2014. 14% of 18 to 24 year olds voted, 57% of 65 to 74 year olds voted. You know, a whopping, whopping difference. That's just a registered. By the way, there are many more registered old people than there are registered young people. When I was running for the primary in 2014, there were 13 of us in there. We, we did the math and said that the average primary voter is a 62 year old woman. And so our efforts were heavily tilted toward older people because we knew that they were the ones that were going to show up. So if you care about, well, I know you care about the things you care about, but if you want to make a difference, if you believe that politics can be an effective force in your lives, you just have to show up. And we'll do everything we can to get the Prove Act passed. We might need a different composition of the Congress or me to be more persuasive with my Republican friends. But, uh, we will be relentless and we will push forward. And thank you for letting an old person start off.